I like to say this begins with a painting, but I don't think it does, does it? No, but it's not no, almost. Okay, this is a painting that my Aunt Jeanette did. My Aunt Jeanette is uh, the um, youngest of three. My father was in the middle. My uncle, Navasar, what a name. He hated, God, he hated that. It's like it was a burden. Uh, he would tell people in, in, in grammar school, just call me John. But it became Nava, which is pretty cool, I think. But Nava started, I think, means new beginning, new age, new. I mean, it's, it's, it's freighted with meaning, let's face it. He was the first born in America. So the painting is uh, it's beautiful. This is the way my aunt does things. Uh, I think that's Manteca, 1946. You said 43, but it might be a little later than that. 43 is about 45. Yeah. Manteca is a farm town in the San Joaquin Valley. My grandfather was a raisin farmer, and but not a very good one. He was a, really a, a lefty, and he carried around the new masses and. Everything was politics, and he didn't see the mildew coming or the vine hoppers coming or anything like that. They just wiped them out. And he ended up as a greengrocer in San Francisco for a decade, and then came back to the valley and started off in Manteca. So it's my grandmother ironing, my father and my uncle were, they really were night and day in some ways. My dad was a towhead. My uncle was dark, my dad was bigger, my uncle was smaller. Um, but my uncle could, could beat my dad pretty good at top of you, though. Yeah. And then there's this sunflower that came from that ran ranch, and it was, in my imagination, it was bigger than that, more epic. But, and then there's the ash tree out there. My aunt is in the reflection there, and then my grandfather and grandmother are also in the reflection. And that's the ash tree. Um, so, I started this foundation in the West and West Center, and part of what we're doing is publishing books. And my uncle Danny wrote this incredible novel, and and um, he came close to getting it published by the New York publishing houses. And I took a look and I said, if I can get this thing going, I'd love for this to be our our first novel. And so. Um, there's nothing inside about this thing. This thing, when you read it, you will see that it's a, it's a book that should have been published by a major house. It's beautifully told. It's the story of our family. At least it's been inspired by that. But it's fiction. Um, and he came at something that I came at in a memoir. He came at it much differently. I wrote a memoir called In My Father's Name. And he came and visited that same stuff, but in a whole different way. And they're very complimentary. Uh, and it also took the burden off of me of having to write a novel about the same thing I wrote a memoir about, because <laughs> I've never, never emerged from that, I don't think. So we're gonna have a little conversation. He's gonna do a little reading, and then we'll do a signing, take some questions. Uh, thank you for coming out. This is a, the timing of this I thought was great in some ways, but it was also not so great. I mean, it's in the middle of the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Um, everybody, I mean, you know, there's just all sorts of events and everything else. And so to come out, I really thank you for coming out. Um, so I think, you know, the obvious question everybody asks, what's fiction, what's, what's not fiction? And, and to me, it's the, the distinction is, is sometimes it's meaningless. I mean, if you look at, I, mean, I remember Soren once saying, you know, you write about what you know in the language that you know it. And Soren, who knows what was real and what was imagined in all his short stories and everything else. I think more of it was real than imagined in some cases. But he brought to it the imagination of fiction and the imagination of a fiction writer. So I want to ask Danny a little bit initially about you know, since this story had been told, if, if that was a burden to him, or if it freed him up, or what did he steal, you know, and what did he imagine, and, and, and give us the arc of the story, too, as you're telling us that. Right, okay, so I, uh, I wanted to write a novel version that uh, allowed 
all of the voices to emerge, and especially the voices of the women, the, of, uh, the mother, whom I name Artemis, and uh, the daughter, Juliet, my name. And uh, I just felt that it was important to let the women's voices emerge and become part of the story. Uh, because they're dynamic, they charge the story, and they complement the story of uh, of the of Garo and of Tigran, and of course of their father, whom I name uh, uh, Ar Armin. So uh, this is part of the Ararat family, and I came into it in 1965 when I married Jeanette. And uh, sort of was absorbed into the clan and heard all of those stories that uh, the uh, that uh, my father-in-law uh, Aram uh, would tell, and also observed so much of the history of the family as it unfolded. And so, when Mark wrote his memoir after the death of his father, in searching for the meaning of what was happening. I, uh, you know, I, I worked with him a little bit, and lit, I became a sort of um, a listener, and a, well, to a certain extent, but, but certainly a listener. Uh, and the, so I uh, absorbed a lot of his sense of the stories, and I had my own sense of the stories, because I had lived through a great deal of it, and the, and so it just seemed the right thing to do. And I wanted also to create a sort of legacy um, for my own children, for Jeanette, and for my own children. And so that was a motivator <laughs> for me as well. And, uh, the, and the other thing about uh, fiction and, and uh, in a sense, memoir, the opportunity I felt in fiction was that I could sort of get a probe deeply into the psychology of each character. I could pro probe deeply, okay, into the psychology of the characters. And, uh, and so there are a lot of layers to each of the characters that emerge, especially because it's written as fiction. I, have, I was able to be, have a free hand to invent, explore, and invent layers. That was part of it too. Nice. Give the um, tell us the how how it opens, the scenes, yes. how you move back and forth in time. All right, fine. So uh, obviously, at the core of the family, and certainly in a sense at the beginning of Mark's memoir, is the death um, of Ara, and in my case, the, the character's name is Garo, and. Uh, so what I've done is to explore the history of the family as it moves up to that tragic moment of the, of the death of, uh, of the son. And so it opens, the novel opens actually with um, the older son coming into the home and telling the mother that her son is dead. And it's a, it's a great blow and a powerful moment. And then I plunge the novel back to the father, uh, uh, Armin's arrival in America and his memories of the genocide, his memories of, uh, the, of his life in, in um, Anatolia and in Constantinople, as he called it, and uh, and then I build, I build on through all the way back to the moment, uh, you know, all the building of lives that was involved, uh, the uh, Armin's building of his life, Artemis, uh, the boys, and and Juliet's attempt to form a new life in in America. And the novel ends then, moves towards the point of crisis and the moment when Garo is killed 
and when the mother learns the death of her son. So it is sense it's, it's framed, it's framed by, by the event. And, uh, so yeah, that's how I conceived it. Yeah. In, when you do that, you're moving back and forth. Yes. The trick is that when you go back in time, when you pivot from wherever you're at back, there's a certain, um, the reader is has a certain patience or impatience. And so it all is about timing and then how much you can, you can indulge the reader to go back, to give them that background. And what Danny does is, because I, I know the the um, the thing not to do is to give the backstory all in one big clump. Okay, um, you f you feel almost compelled that you're going with the backstory to give it all, but no, you have to thread that through, keep threading it through. It's very difficult, um, and you you do it in a masterful way. So, um, last name is Aurochs, it's a pen name. My grandfather took it from the river. What better, he trumped it. He made it Aurochs, the mountain, okay? Um, so, yeah, yeah. And uh, so what I'd like is for you to do some, a little bit of reading of a couple of the voices, and then we'll have some, some questions, so. Wonderful, so all right. So, See, you yeah. hold and read at the same time? I can. Okay. I think so. So I'm going to start with uh, chapter one, which uh, I have the prologue in which that tragic news comes to Artemis. But then I have the first chapter. It's in 1925, bless you. And uh, it's, uh, so I, I'll read you a little bit about, uh, he's living in Berkeley. And he's uh, thinking of becoming, um, uh, going to college because he knew French, he translated French literature, he uh, wanted really to go to the Sorbonne, and so he ends up, uh, uh, Armin, that's right, and uh, so he stays at the uh, rooming house of um, a woman who is the widow of someone who was killed on April 24th in the genocide in 1915 and he um, remembers them and so I'm going to read a little bit of uh, that memory uh, for Armin. So here it is. His landlady uh, Madame Gopian's spirit had been tempered into this unblinking graciousness in the decade since her husband had been arrested at midnight on April 24th, 1915. Uh, the morning of April 24th, a decade ago, Armin, who was uh, about 14 and a, and a half at that point, uh, had been taken by a teacher to Constantinople's Galata district to meet the great Armenian poet Varujan. Uh, when they arrived, there were rumors that something was happening across the Golden Horn in Bayezid Square the huge public space in the center of the city. Go home, his teacher said, Oshadan said. Hurry, yet he delayed, and alone he began to walk down Kalata Hill through the crowded labyrinth of streets. He burst out of the bottleneck on the Galata Bridge and sprinted down a wide palatial avenue to Isaac Square. Uh, he must see what was happening but the vast public space was packed with men. The sea of heads churned before him, uh, the bobbing heads of allowing him only brief glimpses. There seemed to be a gallows set up for a public execution at the center of the square, and then suddenly he saw the phalanx of gendarmes and soldiers standing at attention below a score of hanging men. A bloated brightness had stiffened the bodies, and a crowd of flies hovered around the corpses. Some had been sliced, and the blood had darkened, and the clo uh, clothing 
uh, where the knives had slid. His eyes were raw and fixed in place. All the executed seemed to be Armenians. Twenty men hanging before him. He saw one of his teachers suspended in the middle of the one row of gallows. It was his history professor. Mutilated and dead, and then he recognized the contorted face of Baron Agopian. The lawyer's fine European suit had been slit in several places, and the blood had splotched and thickened. And the wall of backs then closed in on him. The milling crowd in this sweep of public space seethed with a peculiar lust. He had been reckless to come here. And uh, stealthily now, he dodged away from the crowd. He could hardly breathe. Yet he ran and retraced his path back to the Galata Bridge. He must report the horror he had seen to Oshagan, his teacher whose writing would tell a new generation of the catastrophe. So that's one little bit. And, and then I was thinking of reading a bit of um, his experience of the California fields uh, toward the end of the chapter. Uh, so uh, his uh, uncle Hyde was uh, had his own intensity and violence, and uh, and Armin understood the violence in his uncle Hyde, who had uh, written to him in Constantinople and told him come to California and. Then we'll bring the rest of the family, the survivors of the rest of the family. He remembered his first days in the fields around Fresno. Uh, when he felt the blinding sun blast his consciousness. At night on this reclaimed desert, the temperature dropped from 110 to 70 as the flatland descended into darkness. Suddenly, you were almost invisible and bathed in numbing air. It was a blasted desolation, you felt, reducing all the life you knew to your body and its basic functioning, breathing and sleeping, eating and excreting, killing or dying. Your mouth was silenced and your eyes stared blankly at the blackened, endless, moonless fields. A year ago, the great Armenian general Andronik Ozanian had talked with Armin about the ruthless Fresno sun and the cruelty of life. Asthmatic but unbroken, Andranik had recently moved to Fresno, sitting with Armin at the coffee house with Steely, the Steely man with strangely kind eyes, has said, you're a fine, well-spoken young man, Armin, but life is a vicious dog and it will sink its teeth into you if you let it. How could such knowledge fit into a student's life, he wondered. He remembered the hours he had spent translating Anatole France into Armenian, this tremendous effort to capture the voluptuous asceticism, and yet his goal to become a poet and intellectual seemed unreal and false now. All the learning from his apprenticeship with Washington and all the poetry he loved by Verlaine and Mallarmé how could his awareness of all this fit into the life of an immigrant in this savage world? Finally, it was idle to try pursuing an American profession, for it would involve the unimaginable labor of remaking himself completely. And what profession would let him enter, enter it? Anyway, his fate was to float between worlds. Among languages, he was an Armenian in America, in this land halfway around the globe from Anatolia. So words, whether Armenian or French, English or Turkish, became unreal. They would bob and float, ungrounded, almost unspeakable. Words would not survive unscathed after the murder of a million and a half Armenians and the exile of another. Uh, Armin, Armin's experience. And then uh, I wanted to read about Artemis uh, to give you a sense of her experience. Um, we, we watch her and uh, uh, one scene has to do with her, her uncles and her uncle uh, Surin uh, driving the family 
to the funeral of General Andrade, who died in the mid mid uh, mid twenties. So last year, her uncle Soran had driven her family to the massive funeral given for General Anrani, the great Armenian national hero, and her father's commander. They had to park blocks away and walk to the church, decrying her father with his cane and, uh, and the rest. People said there were 4,000 mourners, all of them survivors of 1915, and one way or another. Artemis saw only an ocean of heads and the uh, and backs. They never got into the church. In the hall after the burial, though, her father had positioned the family at one of the tables for the hoki josh, the soul meal, and they heard speech after speech. Across the hall sat her friend Armin Ararat uh, with his family, his mother with her upright posture and striking white hair, his brother. Well, after the genocide, Andernik had spent his last years in Fresno, struggling to cure his worsening asthma. In those last years, Andernik had come to their house. Dikron and he had exchanged stories of fighting in Turkey and the loss of, the, of Armenians to the Sultan. And her father would listen to the handsome general's laments, Artemis, had been allowed to sit at the dinner table the last time General Underneath visited. I've traveled half the world, Dikran, and I've never seen before a place like this, Fresno. Do you understand? I've seen massacre and carnage. I've led armies into battle and with my bare hands killed those who were destined to die. But now I spend my days with petty, empty men who have little knowledge of life and death. His breathing was labored, yet his shoulders were stiff with power and pride. His fine eyes seemed kind and deeply sad, and Anonymous thought of all they had seen. The Armenians in Fresno, he said, know neither what they lost nor what they are about to lose. In America, the Sultan is not a person, but a thing. Its name is money. It will swallow the Armenians whole Dikran and spit out their bones. Underneath seemed to be Lee an alternative life to the paralysis surrounding her and her family. Artemis wished that a woman could lead such a life, could achieve the grandeur and sweep of spirit. If she could, Artemis too would become a general. Whatever, whatever adversity she meant, no matter the challenge, she would never give up, even in the face of death. She would be ready for anything. Danny was able to draw on a lot of his own life here. Um, he grew up in California, in Los Angeles, went to Berkeley, that's where he met my aunt. So that the Berkeley scene right. And then his mother uh, uh, was born in, in, in Kadike, uh, right outside of Istanbul, where my grandfather was. So um, I'm not sure. I asked Danny the other night if, if my grandfather and his mother ever talked about that, and they didn't. But you went back, right? Right. I, uh, I went back. Uh, Jeanette did not want to sleep on Turkish soil, so we took a cruise, our one cruise. And uh, so at lunchtime, you know those big meals they serve you, uh, I excused myself, got off the boat, and traveled up to, I um, raced up the hill of Galata, where um, my mother's family lived, and uh, where Armen, his, much of his education took place there. It's where Varshan lived, and he visited him so, a couple of times and such. And I took photos. <laughs> uh, my camera was constantly going. And so it was fascinating to see the scene of her first seven years. Uh, she was my mother's. Uh, uh, she was born in 04, uh, and then uh, came here in 1911. So, uh, 
So that was a great experience, and it was amazing how you know the similarities uh, in taste, in attitude uh, that she had with with Aram, and uh, you know the Jews and the Armenians, of course. There are many, many connections and similarities. Um, a major one, both have experienced a genocide. So, that's it too. Yeah. <laughs> so, what's your next reading? Yeah, I wanted to uh, read uh, a little bit of, um, of Jeanette's experience. Um, and uh, so, uh, just I love the way he, he's, it's a Julia. Arnold. Oh, very bad. Yeah, but he very does bad. this. You know, so in his mind, it's all, it's all confused. All messed up. Confused, right. confused, confused, confused. Right. Fiction, right. Fact. Fiction and fact. Fiction and fact. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll get through it. <laughs> so here it is. It's on page um, 252. Okay, so. Um, for the honeymoon, um, Sammy Weisberg uh, and Juliet uh, Arad come down to Fresno and live with her parents for a couple of weeks. Why not? <laughs> you know, it saved a lot of money, <laughs> and we were students. So, and um, and so they. Uh, and when they're about to go back, they think about what the house, the apartment they're going to establish and all. And this is just a little bit that relates, that relates to the painting. Uh, it's a, they had started living together earlier this year and he had helped her set up a studio for her art in part of the bedroom. And there was a newly complete painting on her easel there awaiting their return. Fresno, 1946. It's actually Mantica, but it's all right. Would be its title. On one side of it, her mother stood ironing, and the two boys, her brothers, played tableau on the other side, with Tigran throwing dice into the air as Gara watched. On the wall in the middle of the canvas, he had, she had painted a mirror which reflected her father reading, and a child, Juliet, looking directly toward the viewer. The painting was embroidered with vivid patterns, ornamental detail, and the unusual flat perspective Juliet loved in Armenian illuminated manuscripts and in Matisse uh, canvases. The wall, her mother's dress, and the oriental rug border were all bathed in shades of red, it was the color of pomegranate, watermelon, strawberries, tomatoes. There was an ash tree in the window, and along the bottom of the canvas was a row of Armenian witnesses, the faces of ghosts and elders. So uh, that's, that's part of that. And then uh, there are some scenes uh, with um, the Weisberg family, which will be interesting for those who know the Weisbergs. <laughs> but anyway, Ash Tree, tell them what the title is. Yes, the Ash Tree. Um, the, uh, the name in Spanish for, Fres uh, uh, for the Ash Tree is Fresno. Fresno is the Ash Tree. So, in many ways, this is based there in that city and its experience for Armenians. Uh, so, I wanted to read a little bit about... Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, about Garo, just to give you a sense of um, the energy in the rest of the family. Uh, and so... Garo's the younger brother, the one... Yes. Who's, who's the blondie in the painting. That's right, exactly. And he's the one who's... Um, whose death frames the novel. And uh, the, so that to a certain extent, these characters, these people in Mark's work and in my work, they're almost uh, mythic characters. They, they have uh, a, a sort of a force-like 
beings, figures in myth. And so uh, the way I think of it is that another novel might be written, which will take up these in the same way that the Greek myths and all the myths are recycled repeatedly. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's my sense. So anyway, Garo is a sort of mythic character with his great energy and force of personality. And uh, so here's a, a little bit of of his experience, um, he, uh, you know, the the uh, the stores, the markets were lost, and with some settlement, Garo decided to start a restaurant, a bar, and it became a very successful bar in uh, in Fresno, and uh, so here he is at the at the bar uh, when it's first opening. He chatted with two old football buddies from high school who were also in their early 30s and fixtures really at one end of the bar by the TV turned down so as not to intrude on the records playing on the speaker system. He loved having a good mix of music and was always finding new music or rediscovering neglected greats. There was a new single he loved by the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand. And he played it many times a night. <laughs> Occasionally he had a shot of brandy, but not much more. He did not need to, it to feel a buzz. All he needed was the embrace of the bar and his collection of customers, of swingers and family types, of girls and old geezers, and kids just turning 21, friends and strangers. It had become clear to him that people really liked to be with him, especially the girls who seemed to more than like him. His response to their commands had been to tease and hold them off. Hey, watch this, Phil, one of his old football buddies said as he stood to reach the TV and turn it up. A little girl filled the screen and in her hand was a daisy. Picking the petals off it one by one, she was unaware of the massive mushroom cloud from a nuclear explosion bursting behind her. Wow, if that doesn't win Johnson a few votes, uh, Phil said, I don't know what will. But you know, Goldwater brought it on himself with all that saber rattling about Vietnam. The people drinking at the bar seemed dismayed. That's just politics. Garo said loudly, nobody's going to use a nuclear bomb. We're going to end up all living together the way it should be. What do you mean we all live together? A middle-aged businessman, a newcomer at the bar said, you a commie? I'm a capitalist and I'm a communist. Marco Garo said, improvising in front of his customers. It was possible to be both. Uh, let's face it, he thought his father had been both. <laughs> he had joined the Communist Party and he had broken the unions at his stores. I think we should all live in peace. Uh, even those dirty Armenians, a man, the man in the business suits near, he had grown up hearing those slurs against his people. And now that thing, immediate and explosive, arose in him again. Shut your effing mouth. What do you think I am? You big, big guy, you're white. He leaned over the polished surface of the bar and put his face close to the man. He flexed his big hands on the counter. He despised bigots. And he felt his face begin to redden. But you're not going to want to come here anymore. And he was about to say, get the F out of here, when the guy's face collapsed and seemed a dozen years older than he was. Hey, sorry, the man said. No offense intended. That's Carl. <laughs> so, uh, should we read a little bit of the... Why don't you just, I think the last reading, will be, would, I think is the opening. Yeah. Or the closing, because it... The book closes the way it opens, in right. almost with the same repetitive language. Exactly. Which we both wondered about and thought, no, this is, this is the way it should happen. 
This works. Right. So this is the last thing I'll read. Uh, Are you going to read it from the front or the back? What do you think we should do? The front. Read it from the front. The front. Yeah. No, we don't want to give out and give away the ending, even though... We just did. <laughs> we just did. Okay. Each chapter is, is dated, you know, with a year and a month and, and, and day. But this was January 2nd, 1972. So, a death in the family. A car drove out of the foggy darkness and parked in the driveway. From the family room, Artemis heard her husband, Armin, shuffle about in the foyer. A key clicked in the lock and the door opened. It was Tigra, their oldest child. His voice and Armin's met in the entrance. When Tigra mumbled something, a strangled cry came from Armin. Then Tigra walked in, his face hard and colorless. Artemis felt her own face freeze and her shoulders and chest tighten. The tightness made her shake. Tigra mumbled something again. What? she said. I can't hear you. What do you mumble? Garo. She could not hear the rest. What? she spit out, stern and urgent. Garo, ma. Garo is dead. You're talking gibberish, she said. Garo was shot at the bar, Tigran said. You're lying. Don't you dare speak such lies. She spoke in a high-pitched brass and felt the acid of her stomach rise in her throat. Ma, Garo was murdered. He was shot. He's dead. She stared at him and then she screamed. She bit, beat her fists against his chest. No, no. A spasm shook her. She could not bear to be breathing to be standing, to be living, when her younger son was shot. She shrank to the floor, lowering herself to her hands and knees, crawled across the family room to the hall, into her bedroom. A high, thin, acid wail rose from her. A howl. Her arms and legs and back were racked with pain. She crawled to the mirror door in her bedroom, slid it open, and hid inside the closet among the clothes she pulled down. Yeah, not easy to hear, not easy to read and edit either. Right. But um, I don't know. Just I'm really proud of this book. I'm almost as proud. I would be. I'd be lying if I said as proud as one of my own books, but very darn close. This is uh, a real celebration for our family and uh, and in a way this I think Danny's been working on this for uh, many years so questions any, any questions yes beyond the, the lives of the individuals. And uh, 
only a few people will know how much. <laughs> but uh, that's the way it is, right? But it's, it's such a crucial question when you're working with memoir material. And the truth is that a great deal of fiction is actually based on composites of lived experience, of memoir, of, and of models from life. And I think the memoir itself, you move around a lot of furniture, okay? And you end up doing your own kind of composites, and you're guessing. And so there's fiction in a memoir, and there's memoir in fiction. Go ahead. Why the ash tree as the title? And um, one reason is that it has an amazing name, the ash tree, the idea that ash and ashes might yield growth, might form a tree. So it just seems so true. And of course, I've always I've known that the that Fresno meant the ash tree, so it seemed perfect. The other reason is that, uh, and it plays into the plot of this, um, there was a tree in the backyard of the Arak home, as it was in the backyard of the Arak's home. <laughs> and, and it was, uh, you know, a noble tree and impressive. It did release a great deal of uh, what the ash tree releases. It wasn't an ash, but not important. And, and uh, so it was a burden to have back there. And eventually, Alma, and in my novel, Artemis, has it chopped out, <laughs> it eliminated. It should be eliminated, <laughs> right? Because it was too much work. It was messy. It was messy. And, but it seems so significant, and it, it has an impact. It had an impact on us when we, we came back to Fresno to visit. The tree was gone. You know, the whole, in a way, part of the life of, of that property. So, in any case, so there are a couple of reasons and probably more. <laughs> the tree was gone, and in its place was a beautiful garden with okra that climbed up above the rooftop. And it had this wonderful sub-irrigation where my grandfather would irrigate on one side and it would turn dark on the other side. And I said, Pop, what's going on? He says, all the roots of that tree, they're carrying the, the water to the other side. <laughs> it's a pipeline system. <laughs> yes. Like capillaries or something like that. Yes. Go ahead. I'd like to say that you're really a gifted writer. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I purchased the book and you signed it for us last Sunday. Yes. And unfortunately, I had missed this diary. Yes. And uh, knowing Armenian history, knowing the Alax family, yes. I mean, for me, it gives a different perspective because I could see that with only the first three chapters that I read. Yes. But you can't put the book down. I mean, if, if you're really tied to it, and I want to encourage anyone to buy a book, give it to your uh, brother, give it to your grandson or granddaughter, uh, because you'll learn about Armenian history. I mean, because when I read about Antony and Taniel Barajan, and, and I mean, this all tied together. I mean, you did such a beautiful job. Uh, I mean, I can see Uncle and, and nephew how gifted both of you are. And uh, I'm happy that I was able to be here this, this evening at the meeting. From Fresno, oh, God, Alan, that was such a surprise. <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. That <laughs> was, so you know, Grandpa did have a remarkable life. They, they sang in the Gomidas Choir. His teacher was Abu Oshagan. Oshagan came to live with them as he was trying to escape the Turkish army for a while. He knew Varujan. 
Years later, Baudouin's son, who didn't even know his father, was in Fresno with that same magnificent mustache and such sadness, asking Grandpa, tell me about my father. I mean, so, yeah, just yeah. all comes together. Wonderful history. Yeah. Questions? Alan was talking about 
I read a few pages too. I said, Jesus Christ, why don't I write and you write so good? <laughs> you know? And Mark, thank you very much for everything you do. I just want to add something funny, nothing to do with the books. Mark Arch used to work for the LA Times. He was fired because he wrote an article about the Armenian genocide. How many years ago was that? Seven. Seven years ago. And this year, LA Times, the front page, three column picture of the genocide march. What happened in seven years ago? <laughs> Thank you.